Kia ora, it's Efano. Hey, it is so good to have you join us today. Very soon we're going to hear from one of our team, but before we do, we're going to have some worship. Yeah, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for all that you're doing in our church. We adore you, we love you, and we're here to lift you up. Let's worship.
Well, today I want to talk about how to avoid deception. That's a great title, isn't it? And you know, one of the things that I've noticed is that there are a lot of funny ideas out there. There's a lot of people believing funny things. There's even pastors preaching funny things. There's all sorts of stuff that's going on that is not necessarily of God. And so I want to talk about that today. And I'm going to be quoting a lot from the Apostle Paul Paul uh, had planted a lot of churches and he had churches that he oversaw and he gave lots of wisdom and advice. And one of his main protégés was a young man called Timothy. And uh, he would write, he wrote to Timothy, we've got two of the letters and I'm going to read a number of those things out today. You know, the Bible says a lot about the fact that in the last days, a lot of people will get into deception and they'll fall away from the truth. So in in Paul's first letter to Timothy, he says this, chapter four, verse one. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Wow, that's a heavy verse, isn't it? Spirits and demons, eh? So let's talk about this. It says in the last days, and the last days is everything that's happened after Jesus until Jesus comes again. It says that some people, and it's talking about Christians. It's not talking about evil people and people from different faiths and different ideas and philosophies. It's talking about Christians. Some people will turn away from Christianity. They will stop following Jesus and they will fall away. The, the, the word that we use is apostasy. They, they move away from Jesus. And then it gets uh, a little bit spooky because it says they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings from demons. You think, wow, this sounds like Star Wars or something. But you know, the, the Bible uh, has an understanding. It gives us an understanding that there's a whole spiritual world we're living in the, in the physical world, but the Bible lets us know that there's another whole world that is just as real, probably even more real than the one we can see. It's the spiritual realm. And there are these beings that don't have bodies, but they can think and they can act and they can do things and they are called spirits. There are angelic spirits, we call them angels, and there are demonic spirits, evil spirits that the Bible talks about as well. And so this is not some fantasy. This is not some mythological primitive thing they used to think in old days. Jesus used to address spirits. He used to cast spirits out. And so this is something that we in the Western world don't understand. But Paul is saying here very clearly that there are demonic evil spirits and they deceive people. They deceive Christians. And it is their mission to bump Christians off the path, to get them in the wrong direction, to to believe things that are wrong. Their mission is to stop people following Jesus. So Paul is saying in the the last days, these spiritual powers that are under, under the control of Satan, they will influence a lot of Christians. They'll bump them off the path and they'll try to, in fact, they'll be successful in taking people away from Jesus. So their mission is to deceive The problem with deception, folks, is that people never know when they're deceived. That's the whole problem with deception. You just don't know when you're in it. In fact, the whole definition of deception is that you are believing something that is not correct. You are believing a lie. And the thing that's frustrating about people who are in deception is they usually think everybody else is in deception, that they're the only one that's got the right way of thinking. And that often is one key way of discovering a person who's in deception when they think they're the only person that's right and everybody else is wrong. That's a way you can spot them. And sadly, often people who are in deception feel perfectly happy. They are happy with their lives, they're happy with their beliefs and they 
they deceptively think that their happiness is a sign that God is with them or that God is endorsing what they believe. I uh, had a conversation with some pastors uh, recently, uh, not people in, uh, in, in our city here, but they were talking about um, somebody that they knew who had got into a sexual lifestyle um, that, that was not a biblical sexual lifestyle. And they said that the thing is that this person now says that they're happier than they've ever been, even though they're breaking the laws of God. And they think that because they're happy, that obviously means that God is endorsing you know, what, what they're doing. And I find that quite often, that people who are in deception can actually be quite happy. We had a situation here a number of years ago where we had somebody that was one of our kids' church workers that it it came to pass that he was uh, committing adultery, that he was, you know, um, having an affair with somebody in his workplace and his, his wife didn't know anything about it. And it came to light and so I went and confronted this guy and said, you know, is not something happening in your conscience? He said, no, I feel the best I've ever felt. He said, I feel happy. And I said, but what about God? What about God's laws? What about His rules? And he said to me, oh, you know, I don't believe all that traditional stuff. He said, I've come to see God in a new way. God just wants me to be happy. God just wants me to be happy. Friends, there's a lot of deception just in that sentence. God just wants me to be happy. I've got some news today. God does not just want you to be happy. He doesn't just want you to be happy. He wants you to be obedient because we can be happy as a bank robber. There was a whole lot of people that were smashing, grabbing, uh, you know, up in Albany Mall over the weekend and it sounds like they had a great time. They were smashing with hammers and taking jewels. They're probably very happy. And if they get away with it, they're probably happier. It doesn't mean that it's right. And so we've just got to be really careful with this happiness thing because God does not want us just to be happy. He wants us to be obedient. And sometimes obedience does not make us happy. If God speaks into my heart and says, you've got a really bad attitude to somebody, I want you to go and speak to them and I want you to apologise, I don't feel happy. I feel embarrassed and I feel humiliated and I feel as though I've got to be humbled. It's not something I want to do, but friends, it's the right thing to do. If God says to me, hey, there's somebody there that really needs some money and I wanna buy a 500 um, you know, centimetre TV and God says, I want you to use that money instead to give it to somebody who's poor, I may not feel happy and say, woohoo, I'm gonna miss out on my 500 um, inch TV. I'm gonna have to give the, the, the money to somebody else. I may not feel happy, but I'm doing what God tells me to do. So happiness can be incredibly deceptive. We mustn't go on the way we feel because as my dad used to say, our feelings go up and down like a barometer. And one moment you can feel good about sin and the next minute the Holy Spirit can come and say, hey buddy, that thing's wrong. You've got to get your life in order. So, you know, we've just got to be careful about uh, the fact that happiness is the thing that God wants us to have. God wants us to humble ourselves and obey Him. Do you think Jesus was happy when He obeyed God and was nailed to the cross? When He was brutally beaten and tortured, do you think that made Him happy? The Bible says He had joy for, you know, what was going to happen afterwards that He was saving mankind, but He wasn't happy being on the cross. And God does call us to a life of sacrifice where we often give up the happiness. We give up doing our own thing so that we can obey Jesus. Do you know that there are things the Bible says that can seem right, but they are actually dead wrong. In Proverbs 14 verse 12, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So you can think, this seems right, this makes me happy, this, you know, this, this will make my family happy, I'm gonna do this thing here. It can seem right in my head, but the Bible says that is wrong, it will lead to spiritual death. And so we've gotta be really careful about our feelings. So how do people get into deception? Well, let's go back to Paul's letters to Timothy, and this is time the second letter to Timothy, chapter four, verse three. 
For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and they will chase after myths. He's saying there's a time that's coming and friends, I wanna tell you, we're right in that time now where people do not listen to sound biblical teaching. They don't listen to the Bible. They tune around on the internet or they go to churches where people tell them exactly what they wanna hear, where it endorses sin and it endorses lifestyles that are away from what God wants for us. We've had a number of people in recent times that have come to us and said on various issues, I don't agree with your stand on this issue. I find that, you know, it it makes me feel uncomfortable. So I'm gonna go to a church where they endorse the way that I wanna live. And there's numbers of churches that are like this, sadly, and there are numbers of pastors, ministers that will endorse things that are biblically wrong because they wanna open the doors wide so that people will not feel Unaccepted. Now, we want everybody to come to our church. You know, it's true, the saying, God loves you as you are. That's truth. But God does not want you to stay the way you are. He loves you the way you are. He will forgive you. He will clean you up, but He wants to change you into His likeness. He wants to change you so that you become like Him. If you're not going to change to become like Him, God's got a problem. Because the whole point of coming, yes, of course He loves you. He loves you despite all your sin and everything that you do wrong. He loves you with that. But He says, I love you so much. I want to take that sin out. I want to take the sin away. I want to make you whole and I want you uh, to be clean. So people stop listening to the truth. And it says in that verse, they follow their own desires. You see, there are two things. There's biblical truth and there's our own desires and they are against each other. And you can't have it both ways. You can't have your own desires and God's will as well. Something's got to give. So what are you going to do? Are you going to go with your own desires or are you going to go with God's Word? And that's the decision that people have to make. There's a wonderful theologian that many of you will have heard of, an Anglican theologian called N.T. Wright. And he said he noticed when he went to university that some of the lecturers and some of the um, students that he was with in his university, they started out as Christians, strong Christians, and many of them turned away from the faith. And he said most of the time it was because of sexual immorality that what actually happened was they got tempted into sexual sin, they went into that sin and suddenly they thought, "Mm, you know, this isn't compatible with the Bible. So they either change what the Bible says and I'd say, I don't believe that anymore. I'm still a Christian, but I don't believe God's Word. Or they say, I'm an atheist. You know, there's no such thing as God because something's got to give. If you're living in a life of sin, you can't, consistently live with God and and without something given. Either you've got to change God's Word, try and change it, or you've got to say, I don't believe in that stuff and cast it away. Or you've got to submit to it and say, God, I'm so sorry for the way I've lived. Please forgive me and cleanse me and change me. Do you know, there are churches, there are pastors that you can find around that teach the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. And the Bible predicts this. In Matthew 24, verse 11, it says, And many false prophets will appear, and they will deceive many people. Now, we don't look at those verses and think about that much because you think to yourself, well, what does a false prophet look like? And I must admit, the, the thing that comes into my mind is, you know, a person with sort of a long beard and a robe and, and maybe a funny hat or something like that. And you don't see any of those people around because that's not what they look like. They look like normal, average, everyday Christian people. That's how you get deceived. You know, if you wanted to produce counterfeit money, you wouldn't make it look completely different from the money that is in circulation. If somebody handed you a $13 bill, would you be slightly suspicious? Hmm, I've never seen one of these before. Of course they wouldn't hand that out. They will hand out something that looks like the real thing. 
That's the way it fools you. And there are people, people who are false prophets, they look right, they sound right, they might be very kind, they might be very gentle, they may be very loving, but they may also be very deceived. And it all comes down to what is in somebody's heart and what are they preaching? So Jesus predicted this 2,000 years ago. He said, this is what's gonna happen. There are gonna be people that come and they're gonna teach you the wrong thing. They may look nice, they may be kind, they may be wonderful people, they may be family, they may be friends, but it doesn't stop the fact that they will be teaching you a lie. Doctrines of spirits and demons. Jesus also said in Matthew 7, verse 15, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep. So that's what they do. They disguise themselves as sheep. I mean, not physical sheep. They don't sort of, ah. <laughs> they come and they look like ordinary Christians. But it says, but really they are vicious wolves. See, this is the thing. You, you know, Jesus talks about sheep being Christians you know, the people are going to look like Christians. Don't look at a person and think, oh, but they look so lovely. They look so sweet. They look so nice. Because they're nice and I like them and they dress well and they're nice people and I know their family, doesn't mean that what they tell you is the truth. Jesus is saying they may look like sheep. They may, the wool might feel like sheep. It may smell like sheep, but it's not sheep. So how do you know? Well, Jesus goes on to tell us in verse 16, you can identify them by their fruit. In other words, what is produced from their life? Uh, In other words, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. So what what Paul is saying here, what Jesus is saying here, is he's saying you've got to look at the person's life, but you've got to see what is produced from their ministry. When they preach things, does it bring people closer to Jesus? Does it cause people to be closer disciples, to love God more, to be more hungry for the Word? Does it cause people to repent of their sin, to turn away and start following Jesus and becoming like Jesus? Or do people go further into sin Do they holus bolus take the way that the world lives and adopt that instead? You know, I've known churches that are so open to everybody, which is great, we wanna be open to everybody, but there's so much of endorsement of sin. There's so much, there's a lack of correction and and it's just sort of, oh, Jesus just loves you as you are. He loves what you do, just keep on going. And so it's what I call the departure lounge, where you know it's one step away from giving away your faith completely. You know, we can be a church that welcomes and loves, but we also need to be a church that helps people to follow Jesus and shows them and teaches them the Bible and say, this is the way we flourish. Sure, you can go down a path and you can do these things and we'll still be kind and we'll still love you, but this is the way you flourish. You know, and this is what God wants. Don't confuse what you're doing with Christianity. Because yes, God forgives you and He wants to cleanse you and and all that stuff, but He also wants you to obey. He wants you to to become more and more like Him. So God does care the way we behave. And you know, one of the the huge deceptions that uh, is around is the concept of grace. I mean, grace in itself is not a deception, obviously. You know, God saves us by grace through faith, the Bible says. But that doesn't mean that we can just live an immoral lifestyle. And many people believe that it actually means that. Once I've been saved, I can actually live like the rest of the world. I can just live immorally. I can live unethically. I can just do whatever I want to do because way, way, way back there, I made a decision uh, to give my life to Jesus. And so He's forgiven everything and I don't need to worry about how I live. And friends, that is incredible deception. The Bible says, do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that also he shall reap. And so the thing is, yes, grace is outrageously wonderful. You can commit the worst sins on the planet. You can do horrendous, terrible things and you can come to God time and time again and say, oh God, I've sinned. Please forgive me. And God's grace will always reach to you. That's how awesome grace is. 
But grace is not a licence to sin. It's not a licence to sort of say, oh, I can just do whatever I want. I can sort of have affairs and I can rip people off and I, can, I, can, I, can, I never ever go to church. I never read my Bible. I never do anything because I've been saved by grace. It is not a licence to sin. Grace is the power to help you not to sin. When you're saved by grace, God gives you the spiritual power that helps you cut sin off. So a person who's saved by grace, you'll know the fruit because they start to look more and more like Jesus. If a person thinks they're saved by grace and they start looking less and less like Jesus, friends, something has gone terribly wrong. And we can't just say, oh, well, they've been saved by grace. I think we need to say, well, you know, somehow the the Holy Spirit is not being able to work. So we've got to look at the way people behave and God wants us to come and challenge people just very gently and lovingly and encourage them to to follow Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. You know, the concept in the Bible is not being a Christian, but it's actually being a disciple. And a disciple is a person who not only follows Jesus, but tries to become like Him in everything they do. So how do we find truth? Well, there is only one person that we can come to who is truth and his name is Jesus. Friends, you cannot 100% trust anyone else, including me. You can't trust any, you can't trust any human 100%, but you can trust Jesus. All of us get things a bit wrong from time to time, but Jesus is the source of absolute truth. And you know, There are so many philosophies and religions and ideas and stuff on the media. It's just so confusing with everything out there. And you think, oh, what do I believe and which way to go? And Jesus knew about that. And that's why He said these words in John 14 verse 6. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Oh, that sounds very narrow. Yes, it is. It's very narrow. Oh, it's, oh my goodness, it's so exclusive. Yes, it is, it's exclusive. Because friends, truth by its very nature is exclusive. Yeah. You know, when I go into my bank account, I have to get all the numbers right. Isn't that, isn't that terrible? I can't even get one number wrong. You know, it corrects me if I, so if I type a number and say, sorry, wrong person. If I put my password in, I just get one tiny little thing wrong. It says, sorry, isn't that, isn't that narrow-minded? They show no grace in the bank whatsoever. There's no lenience at all. I mean, I'd love to just be able to type any old number in and just guess something on the spot. But for some reason, they've got stupid rules. But friends, truth by its nature is exclusive. Ah, oh, but you know, all these other religions, they're all so good and all these other philosophies, all roads lead to Rome, don't they? Friends, no, they don't. All roads lead to hell, except for one. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus is saying. All roads lead to hell, except one. I am the way. I'm talking about Jesus here, not me. (laughs) Just in case you think, oh my goodness, we've got a heretic right in front of us. (laughs) I am the way, the truth and the life. No one, says Jesus, comes to the Father but by me. So what am I saying? I'm saying there is no other way. Of all the ways, I'm the way. Of all the different truths out there, I'm the truth. You want life, you want eternal life, there is only one way to get it. You can't go down the reincarnation pathway. You can't go down any of the others. The only way to get life is through Jesus. How do you get to heaven? There's only one way through Jesus. You cannot get there any other way. It's impossible. And if you don't believe that, you are not a Christian. Because that that is a prerequisite thing to believe for a Christian. So anything else is heresy. There's no wiggle room. You can't can't type in the wrong password to get into heaven. You've got to have Jesus. There is no other password to get in. You can't mention any of the other names. It's just Jesus. It's very exclusive. So when people accuse us of, you know, just being narrow like this, we say, yes and amen. It is very narrow. It's very easy to understand. Jesus said, I'm the only way, I'm the only person who has the truth. I alone give eternal life. No one gets to God through me. 
So that's, that's one thing, it's Jesus. The second thing is we can trust the Bible. We can trust it, folks. I know you can go to some churches and they say, oh, they give you all these ideas why you can't trust it. Oh, you've got to be careful of the way it was interpreted and it was just human beings and you know sometimes they got it wrong and they all argued about which books should be in and which, load of rubbish, all load of rubbish. If I had three or four hours to explain it to you, I would, but I'm not going to. Um, I'm just going to tell you this. Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God, all of it. If you look up the Greek word for all, it means everything, all of it. Every word is inspired by God. And I love this, when you look at the Greek word for inspired, it's the Greek word theonoustos, which means God breathed or communicated by God. And theonoustos is made up of two base words, theo, which means God, and pneuma, which means breath or spirit. Now, both in Hebrew and in Greek, the word for breath is the same word as spirit. In Greek, it's the word pneuma. So the translators have to look at the context to know whether it's saying spirit or whether it's saying breath. But in this case, you can say either. It's saying all Scripture is God-breathed spirit. In other words, it's saying, Every word of the Bible has got God's breath on it. It's got God's Spirit on it. Every part of it, God's breathed on it. So you can trust it. And then when you put it uh, into, let's take the whole Scripture there, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God and it is useful to teach us what is true. So do you wanna find where the truth is? You go to the God-breathed Scripture. That's how you find the truth. It's really simple. Just go and look it up and find out what God says. It's, it tells us what's true. It makes us realise what is wrong in our lives. So don't worry about the teachers and the preachers and the podcasts and everything that tell you all this other stuff. Go and see what the Word of God says and it will tell you what's wrong in your life. It'll tell you. And you've got to bring your life under the Lordship of Jesus. It'll tell you what's wrong in your life and it corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. That's a good synopsis of the Bible, isn't it? It's our one source of truth. It is God-breathed. It is His Word to us. You know, one of the problems in society today is that people have a much higher view of subjective truth. In other words, the truth according to me. And so, People like to think of things, well, what do I believe? That's the highest value in our society. What do I believe? That's right, it is all about me. Um, It's sort of like, you know, what do I think? What do my friends think? What's popular? What does the peer group say? What's society doing? You know, what will keep me in the right groups? That is the most important thing to people. And so what people do is they have uh, their own view first and then they look at the Scripture and they try to cherry pick things out that suit what they believe. And they say, oh, yes, I believe that bit. And I believe, oh, I don't believe that bit. Don't believe, oh, I don't don't believe that. And they'll come up with some reason why this bit is uncomfortable and this bit is is not true. And friends, that is deception. The doctrine of spirits and demons. Absolutely dangerous. You know, the biblical way of looking at the Bible is that Jesus is Lord. And the Bible is His Word and it is our authority. And it dictates the way we live our lives. So I look at the Bible and I look and I say, oh my goodness, it says that. Well, I better change my life to conform to that. Oh, it wants me to do this thing. Oh, that's really uncomfortable. Okay, well, I guess I better because that's what the Bible says. So the Bible is in the highest place. I have to submit my life to the Word of God rather than the Bible being submitted to my way of thinking. And friends, sadly, our world and even within our churches, it's not like this. And there are these social issues that come up. And I get into discussions with people and I just sort of think, oh my goodness, you don't have a biblical worldview at all. And I wouldn't say it to them, but I think you're you're actually spouting the doctrine of demons. You've been completely deceived because believe it or not, the media and education and social media and the politicians and all those sorts of things are not all breathing out lots of truth. That's a bit of an understatement, really. But you know, they're not, they're not, the, they're not the funnel, they're not the funnel 
of, you know, God. I mean, there's truth in, every, in, in things everybody says. You know, there's common truth. But we must not get the way we believe from our government, from society, from, you know, the, the Bible says the world, from secular culture and all that sort of thing. We have to get our beliefs and ideas from the Scripture. Otherwise, we do not have a biblical worldview. You know, a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, well, the, the Bible needs to be updated. No, it doesn't. You need to be updated. You know, the Bible does not need um, the latest software download from Apple. It does not need to be um, made relevant. But friends, your life needs to be made relevant to God. It needs to be regularly updated. In fact, it needs to be updated every day. Do you, on, your, on your devices, if you push auto, your devices just get updated all the time. And God wants you to be updated every day as you read His Word. That's the way you get updated. Because every day your views go in the wrong direction a little bit. Mine do. And I start doing or saying things. And, and when I read the Bible or God speaks to me in my prayer time, God says, you're out of line. I think, oh, that's right, I am. I said something or I believed something or I stepped over a line and I, I, I got it wrong. And God corrects me. And friends, that is what the Bible is there to do. It is there to correct us. We do not correct the Bible. We don't read it and say, well, I don't believe that and society doesn't believe that. So let's look for some type of way that we can discredit the Bible and and think of some reason why it's actually not um, uh, current for today. Just very quickly, I wanna go into another couple of things that bug me um, just because I'm, (laughs) I'm getting a lot off my chest today. But, you know, there's a lot of people around today who are saying, God told me this and God told me that. And I want to just say there's a lot of rubbish out there about what, what God, God told, allegedly told people. And friends, I just want to give a caution. We just need to be so careful in the ways that we believe we're hearing from God. Now, if it's in the Bible, you can trust that 100%. You can say, God told me to repent. God told me to get rid of my sin. God told me to be faithful to my wife or to my husband. God told me to be, have love, joy, peace, patience, all that sort of stuff. You don't need any extra wisdom on that. But if you're making a big life decision, like buying or selling a business or moving home or um, you know, uh, you know, doing something that's gonna have massive impact on your family, you need to have more than... God just told me. You've got to get wisdom and make sure it actually is God because I have so many people that come to me who are in a terrible mess. And I I say, how on earth did you get to where you are? And they say, well, God told me. I think, oh my goodness, I don't think He did. And I think they come to realise that, but they come to realise when things are just too late or things are in just such a mess. And so we've just got to be so careful, you know, People get them into big fin- themselves into big financial pickles. And people come and ask for help. They say, oh my goodness, would you pray for me? How I can get out of this mess? And I do think to myself, but I don't say, I think you would have avoided this mess if you'd actually come and talk to me before you made the decision and got a whole lot of people around you to pray and get wisdom about whether you know, what you're doing is, is, is the right thing. Because um, I hear a lot of people going on just these very feeble words that they think come from God and it's getting them into trouble. I'm very hesitant to ever say, God told me this because I don't think anybody hears God that clearly. I certainly don't. I mean, I, I can get it wrong. I, I, I get it wrong. You know, sometimes I, I um, feel that God's saying something, but I have a big testing process. If anybody ever says to you that they always hear from God 100% of the time, they are a terrible liar and also they're in complete deception. I had a guy that actually a few years ago that came here to talk to me and he said he was a prophetic guy and I challenged him about some of the stuff he did and he told me that he always got it right. I said, really? You always get it right? He said, yes, he did. He's not even following Jesus now, not even a believer. And um, you know, I just think, oh my goodness, this guy had got himself into so much deception. We've got to be humble. And when we teach people to give words of prophecy and stuff, we never say to people, just say, God told me this. We say, look, I'm not 100% sure about this and I could be wrong. And you know, you've just got to, I'm just learning at this, but I think God maybe, possibly, might be, could be. Not sure. He could be saying such and such, but you weigh it up and you test it and, and, and it could be wrong. 
And that's a biblical way to come across because New Testament prophecy is, is something that we have to weigh and test. In the Old Testament, they got it right or they got stoned to death. I don't wanna do the Old Testament way of doing things <laughs> because I don't have that much faith in myself to be able to get it right. So we need to, we need to, um, we need to test these words that come. And I see a few times in situations, especially with husband and wife situations, often the man will say, God's told me to do such and such. And you know, it's a big decision. I think, oh my goodness. And I talk to the wife and I say, what do you think? And they say, well, I don't really think it's right. I'm not quite sure, but he's heard from the Lord. And I think, but has he? And so there's gotta be ways of testing these things. So I've come up with a few things and we're racing through here, how to test if a word is from God. Number one, does it line up with Scripture? If it doesn't, it's wrong. Number two, does your spouse witness to it if you are married? Does your spouse witness to it? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong if your spouse doesn't witness to it, but it's a really good check. I believe in having harmony between a husband and wife in a decision. How many different ways have you heard from God? Is it wise? Sometimes people just do completely dumb things and they say it's God. And I've come across a few in the last couple of years where people come with these harebrained schemes. And I'm not trying to be meany, but they come with these things. And I know it's crazy, but it's so crazy. I thought it must be God. I think God doesn't work that way. God doesn't get you to do completely stupid things, usually. You know, occasionally there are some crazy things. But, but, but number five, have you checked it out with godly friends or church leaders? Get, get some accountability around you. Who are you accountable to? Everybody should be accountable to somebody. So if you've got a big life-changing thing, you should get some people around you and say, I wanna be accountable to you. I wanna give you these words. Will you pray with us? Because we're not 100% sure we think God might be saying this, but we're not sure. Would you pray with us and help us to be able to discern? Do you and everyone around you have peace? Are you open to being wrong? Don't rush into big decisions. You know, I see some people rushing into things and I, my kids get sick of me saying, but if you've got a rush, I think it possibly is the wrong thing. Yeah. You know, make the decision now. You know, if you make your decision in the next five minutes, you'll get Jinsu steak knives, you know. <laughs> Come on, dial up. You know, you, it's the deal of a lifetime. You know, we've just got to take time. You know, if it's God, we can actually have the time to relax and, and get good wisdom around us. Check with experts in the field. Sometimes I've known people uh, who've made these huge business decisions because God told them and they've lost everything or they've um, you know, just got themselves into a terrible pickle. And it's just such an important thing. I'm constantly saying, go and talk to a lawyer, go and talk to an accountant, go and talk to a business person, just because God speaks through those people as well. You know, don't just wake up in the night with a, a thought and think, well, that's God. Test it. You are not disobeying by testing these things. Ask, ask others to pray and seek for confirmation and don't proceed without clear confirmation. Um, oh, I'm running out of time, so I'll leave a whole bit there. I was gonna mention for a few moments just personal prophecies. And I'll just say on that, please don't go around giving births, deaths and marriage um, you know, advice to people. You know, the Bible says uh, in Corinthians, uh, one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them and comforts them. There have been, I met just a guy last week and he was just telling me about a very painful divorce he'd been through. He said, we were just so mismatched. He said, I didn't even really love her, but he said, I was at this church and all the leaders prophesied that we were supposed to be together, so we got married. And he, and he said, in retrospect, it was just, it was wrong. And people do so much damage you know, prophesy, you know, people have terminal illnesses and saying, the Lord's told me you're going to get healed. Well, you can say, the Lord, you know, I think the Lord may be going to heal you. But see, the problem is that if these prophecies turn out to be wrong, people get devastated and they blame God. Right. And these are ways that people lose their faith. I've had so many people that have come whose faith is completely shattered because some nincompoop gave them a, a, a thought that came out of their heads about something that probably they thought was right, but it just led the person completely astray. And some people are holding on to things that people have told them years ago and they, they can't move above a glass ceiling because somebody told them something once. And I wanna say, just because a person told you that doesn't mean it's God. 
test it. When people give me prophecies, I say, thanks very much. Put it in my back pocket and then I see if it comes to pass. And if it doesn't, I think, oh, that was wrong. If it does, I think, oh, wow, that was right. Prophecies tend to be a confirmation. I'm never gonna let a prophecy change the whole course of my life unless Jesus stands in front of me or an angel or a whole group of people have prayed about a thing. Then I'll take it seriously. But just somebody... um, Popping up, and I get so many people that actually come, um, you know, uh, who just give nutty things. I don't want people to be put off from coming and talking to me, but I always say to people, the nut, you can always tell a nutty one because they don't belong to churches and they have no form of accountability, they're the ones in deception. Um, and so they come up and say, Oh, the Lord's told me, blah 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 blah. And it, it you know, there's something in my spirit, think, Oh. And so I say, what church do you go to? Oh, I don't go to church. All the churches are of deception. The Lord just speaks to me. I think, ah, Fruit Loop. You know, um, you know, you are listening to the doctrines of demons and evil spirits. That's what it is, because the Bible says that New Testament prophecy is done in teams, and and you know, it's it's accountable, and we we've got to test things uh, with others. So we've just got to be very careful. There's a lot of self-proclaimed prophets around. So as we sort of draw to a close, it's just so sad that many people are falling away and Jesus predicted it. Matthew 24, 10 to 13, Jesus said, many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. It is so sad because I see so many people falling away. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, Paul says, But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Jesus will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily put up with what, whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you receive, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. Friends, there's a lot of people out there that that preach a different Jesus and a different gospel. You can go to different churches and you hear some say, that's not what Jesus says in the Bible. That's not correct. That's not the truth. You can't just believe any old thing and get into heaven. It's a different Jesus. And we've got to have our antennae up and think, oh my goodness, this is heresy. We've got to be... We've got to be so careful. And just, just a note I want to say, you know, there's this word around at the moment called deconstruction. And deconstruction, you may have heard it, um, is sort of where people just get full of doubt and they think, I'm going to pull my faith to bits and see what makes it work. The problem is they deconstruct their faith and they don't know how to put it back together again. And there's a lot of people deconstructing and once again, I'd call that the departure lounge. Many people, it's just a step away from falling away. Now, I want to tell you something. Uh, I've got this wonderful cartoon at home and it's a picture of a mechanic in his office and he's taken this car to bits and there's six million pieces all over the, you know, the, the ground. He's taken every last screw and bolt and nut and everything and just spread it all over his thing. He's on the phone to this woman and he said, I found the source of the rattle. It was a marble in the ashtray. <laughs> so he's completely disassembled this whole car. Now I want to tell you, if there was a rattle in my car, I would not be disassembling it myself. I'd be taking somebody, I would be taking it to somebody that knows what they're doing. And it's the same with our spiritual faith. If you're having doubts, don't try to disassemble it by yourself. Get somebody that knows what they're doing. Get people, I mean, everybody goes through doubts and there are some wise people that can help you look at your faith and show you how robust it is. Don't hang out with people who are false teachers, people who want you to fall away from your faith anyway because they will just help you go down that path. You know, Satan is so incredibly cunning and we need to stay on the right path. So finally, this is the very last thing. How do you avoid deception? Number one, make Jesus your Lord. And that means he's the boss, he's in charge, I'm gonna do what he says. So it's not me on the throne, it's Jesus on the throne. Number two, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. So ask Him to guide you. Study your Bible. Read it every day. Every day that you read it, it will download truth into your heart. Read it and understand it. And it's really important to read it in context. 
You know, I read a little bit earlier from Psalm 37, God will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, great. Well, my desire is, you know, to um, steal some money from, you know, the Albany Mall. Did you see those guys at Albany Mall that were smashing all those things and stealing stuff? You know, that is a verse taken out of context. You may think, oh, my desire is to look at pornography. God wants me to have the desires of my heart. No, no, no. You've got to read that uh, in context. So study your Bible, choose a Bible-believing church. If you don't come here, choose one that they actually believe in the Bible. Make sure that the pastor of the church you go to has good accountability. There are two types of, of groups to avoid. One is a place that has no leaders. That's not biblical. Or the other extreme is a, a person that has got a pastor and he has all authority and no one can question him or her. There's no forms of accountability. He says, God told me and nobody can challenge it. It, it just has no um, testing procedure in there at all. And that's dangerous as well. Two extremes that are dangerous. Go to church regularly. I find that people who pull away from church automatically tend to slide into deception. Because when we're in church, we're hearing the Word, we're hearing worship, the presence of God is around and there's testing for things that's coming all the time. When you're by yourself, you are much more prone to a wolf coming and giving you wrong thoughts. Isolation is one of the, the devil's greatest tricks. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews, we must not avoid gathering together. You know, the Bible says, you know, when it talks about the Sabbath, yes, it's a day of rest, but it was a day of worship. It was a day when everybody throughout history has come together to worship God and there is safety when we belong to a church. It doesn't need to be this church, but somewhere where you can come and you've got safety. Join a home group. If you wanna go deep into things, you wanna have deeper relationship, join a home group. Find godly people who you can be accountable to. That's so important. Do you know, you know I'm a pastor, I'm a senior pastor um, of you know, different churches, uh, overseeing different churches, but I have a whole group of people in different ways that I'm accountable to. I have a supervisor that I speak to every week or almost every week. And I tell them all the things that are going on in my heart and all the things, things I'm struggling with. And, you know, have I made that right decision? What do you think about this? Completely outside the church. He's a Christian. He prays for me every day. I have other pastors that I ring. There's been an issue that's been going on and I'm thinking, am I handling this right? Am I being godly in my response to a thing? So I've rung up a couple of pastors this week and said, look, this is what I'm thinking. Challenge me if you think I've got a wrong heart attitude about this. I want you to tell me, you know, if you think this is wrong. All of us need accountability um, in, our, in our lives. Otherwise we get into deception. Consult godly people before you make decisions and regularly repent of sin and obey God in everything. Because when you repent of sin regularly, it gives the Holy Spirit a chance just to come and speak to you. Say.